in the early hours of Saturday the 22nd of January 2005, the burning body of a young woman was found within a public shelter located on the seafront of Eastbourne, a town on the UK's south coast. A children's pram full of belongings had been left on top of the victim, who was discovered to be a mother of three living a transient lifestyle after suffering from a severe mental health breakdown in the years leading up to her untimely death. A post-mortem examination would reveal a total of 16 stab wounds and that a sexual assault had also taken place. The brutal attack briefly made local and national headlines, however media coverage quickly dried up as the investigation struggled to uncover any new lines of inquiry. Over the years, links to notable serial killers in the UK have been dismissed by Sussex Police. Could a scientific breakthrough in the case 15 years after the murder hold the key to identifying the person or persons responsible? Welcome to the Crime Portal. This is the case of Jennifer Kiley. Located roughly 50 miles south of London, Eastbourne is a picturesque seaside town located on England's south coast with a population of just over 100,000 residents. Eastbourne is immediately east of Beachy Head, the highest chalk sea cliff in Great Britain, with tourists flocking to the town in their millions each year to take in the stunning views and enjoy Eastbourne's iconic seafront. At around 5am on Saturday the 22nd of January 2005, a pair of cleaners employed by the local council were working on the lower promenade on Eastbourne seafront, close to Beachy Head, when their attention was drawn to a nearby public shelter. A fire was clearly visible inside the structure. Upon closer inspection, the pair realised they'd made the horrifying discovery of a deceased female engulfed within the growing flames. On top of the victim was a double children's pram containing what appeared to be a variety of personal belongings. The council workers quickly phoned 999 and a police presence was immediately established at the shelter to seal off what was obviously the scene of a murder. Chief Inspector Tony O'Donnell was appointed to lead the investigation named Operation Kitty Wake. Not only were investigators unable to find anything at the scene that would appear to help identify the killer or killers, there was nothing to identify the victim either. Despite the number of items found within the pram at the scene that appeared as if they could belong to the deceased woman, there was no wallet, or bank cards, no mobile phone, or anything else that revealed who the victim was. A post-mortem examination took place within hours of the discovery of the body, and revealed that the victim had been subjected to a brutal and frenzied attack, sustaining a total of 16 stab wounds to the upper body. The upper body was also worst affected by the fire. A brief description of the victim was released to the public. She was petite, about 4 foot 10 inches to 5 feet tall, possibly with brown, shoulder length hair. Police added she may have been wearing a pink, padded jacket and, slash or, a black heavy woolen coat. Notably, she was wearing an elephant charm bracelet on her left wrist and necklace described only as plain thin metal. It does not appear as though images of these items were ever released to the public. Tony O'Donnell initially told the media, quote, this was a horrific attack on the victim. We urgently need the help of the public in identifying the woman. I would ask anyone with information to contact us as soon as possible. On Monday the 25th of January, a formal press conference was held at which Mr O'Donnell addressed the media alongside Chief Superintendent Paul Pierce of Sussex Police. Mr O'Donnell described the killing as a macabre case and went on to say, quote, I can say from her injuries that this attack was sustained with a high degree of ferocity from the latest results of the post-mortem, it appears that the woman was also subjected to a serious sexual assault. We urgently need to know who she is. It was confirmed that police were using both DNA and dental records in an attempt to identify the murdered woman, and the following day announced that they had been successful. The victim's family were informed of the tragic news before she was named publicly as 35-year-old Jennifer Kiley. At the time of her murder, Jennifer Kiley was living a transient lifestyle on the streets of Eastbourne, but it hadn't always been this way. A few years prior to her death, Jennifer had been living in Orpington, Kent, with her partner John, their daughter and two young sons. Sadly, following the birth of the couple's third child, Jennifer's mental health is said to have rapidly deteriorated. Her ex-partner would go on to shed light on Jennifer's situation in a statement given to the media a week after her killing. Quote, Unfortunately, she had developed some problems with mental illness, which resulted in her vanishing six years ago and not keeping in contact with any of her family or children. Although some attempts to locate her were made by her family and myself, we were unsuccessful. 
I am writing this so people will visualize that she was a young, attractive and loving lady with children and a family that are missing her and not just a homeless bag lady that will not be missed. I am absolutely gutted by our loss. We are all in shock and deeply saddened to know we will never ever see her again and to learn the horrific way she was murdered. According to the independent newspaper, Jennifer's first move following her mental health struggles was to Brighton, where she reportedly sold the Big Issue magazine, a street newspaper sold by homeless people or individuals at risk of homelessness, giving them an opportunity to earn a legitimate income. In 2003, she moved roughly 95 miles east to Canterbury. There, Jennifer stayed in a local sheltered housing scheme run by the Scrine Foundation, a charity now known as Catching Lives. Lloyd Hubbard Mitchell, chief executive of the organization at the time, told The Independent, quote, She was cooperative. She was not aggressive or angry and kept herself very, very clean. She defied the stereotype of the homeless. Jennifer left Canterbury in September 2004, making her way to Eastbourne. Pat Orcock, a community services coordinator at the Salvation Army in Langney Road, Eastbourne, would later give insight into Jennifer's life after she moved to the town in which she would eventually be found murdered, telling the Argus newspaper, quote, Jennifer was coming to us five days a week, Monday to Friday, for food in the six weeks prior to her murder. When she was here, she was shy. She didn't want to talk about where she came from or what she was doing. She said she was passing through. She wouldn't give any details about herself. She was the type of person who would withdraw into herself if pushed for information. Although they were severe enough to cause Jennifer to abandon her family life, whatever mental health issues she was battling during her final years appear to have remained undiagnosed, or at least have not been fully explained publicly in the years since although it has been suggested by some media outlets that she was suffering from schizophrenia. Her mother Margaret would tell the BBC years later, quote, I think she was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, and he tried to help her, but Jennifer was too proud. Jennifer would sleep where she could, staying with friends, in hostels, and also on the street, occasionally taking refuge in the seafront shelters, where her body would eventually end up being found. She was well known by the local community and was often seen pushing her belongings around in her double pram, wearing a distinctive long grey coat. Now the police knew the victim's identity, their next priority was to establish a timeline of Jennifer's last known movements. They learned that the day prior to her murder on Friday the 21st of January, Jennifer had spent the day with friends at an address in Upperton Gardens, located roughly a mile from Eastbourne Seafront. She apparently came and went from the address several times during the day. That night, Jennifer took a bath at the address before heading out at around midnight. The homeowner told police that Jennifer was, quote, alone and seemed in good spirits. At 1am on Saturday the 22nd, Jennifer was seen by a friend that knew and recognised her. She is said to have been walking with her pram in a westerly direction along the seafront towards Beachy Head. After that, the trail seemed to go cold. A day after Jennifer's identity was announced to the public, a £10,000 reward was offered in exchange for information leading to the conviction of her killer or killers. The two and only arrests reported in connection with Jennifer's murder both occurred within a week of the crime taking place, with limited details made public. A 26-year-old man was arrested in Dover, roughly 70 miles from Eastbourne. No other details were released except that he had been living in Eastbourne and was originally from Eastern Europe. Speaking about the arrest, Tony O'Donnell said, quote, We are remaining open-minded, but this man is certainly of interest to our inquiry. The second man arrested was 36 years old and detained at a flat in Eastbourne. Both men were released without being charged. Within weeks, the investigation was struggling to generate any new lines of inquiry, and the decision was made to feature Jennifer's murder on the BBC's Crime Watch programme. The episode aired on Tuesday the 15th of March 2005. Unfortunately, at the time of recording this video, the Crime Watch episode is no longer available online, with only a few seconds of footage used in another episode years later still viewable, in which Tony O'Donnell can be seen talking to presenter Fiona Bruce. 
This episode contained a reconstruction of Jennifer's last known movements and is said to have generated a number of new leads. The day after the Crime Watch episode aired, the Argus newspaper reported that a woman fitting Jennifer's description was seen with a man outside the Atlantic Hotel on Pevensey Road. Police had revealed that the argument had taken place at around 6pm on Friday the 21st of January and appealed for any information about the person Jennifer was seen with. Unfortunately, no description of the individual appears to have been given, other than him being red-haired. This appeal was followed by several others in the following days. Investigators were seeking two women in their 30s speaking English but with a quote, foreign accent, who were seen walking along the seafront between 1am and 2am. Also asked to come forward was a baseball cap wearing cyclist seen in the same area at the same time and two men of Mediterranean appearance. In addition, detectives appealed to a man dressed in black with an Eastern European accent who was reported to have asked the manager at the Grand Hotel for directions to the station at around 3am. Around the same time, another man was seen running down Grand Parade, a road which runs parallel to the seafront. He was dressed in all black except for his bright white trainers. The driver of a vehicle which swerved to avoid a man walking in the middle of Compton Street at around 3am was also asked to contact police. There are no reports to suggest any of these individuals were ever traced. Operation Kittyweight continued, however a lack of new leads meant that Jennifer's murder saw no further media coverage for an entire two years when an inquest was held, following which it was reported that coroner Alan Craze determined a verdict of unlawful killing. Detective Chief Inspector Graham Pratt of Sussex Police told the inquest, quote, A motive has never been completely confirmed. During the investigation, two main suspects were arrested. One of these suspects remains a suspect at this time. The investigation remains unresolved and will be subject to regular review. Mr. Pratt would also reveal that investigators had reviewed over 1,800 hours of CCTV footage during the search for Jennifer's killer. A few months later, in November 2007, it was reported that Jennifer's case would be looked at as part of Operation Anagram, a nationwide police investigation into the life and movements of Scottish-born serial killer and sex offender Peter Tobin. At the time, Tobin had just begun serving a life sentence after being found guilty of the rape and murder of 23-year-old Polish student Angelika Kluck a year earlier. In September 2006, Peter Tobin was working as a handyman at St. Patrick's Church in Anderston, Glasgow, where Angelika was also working as a cleaner. Angelika was last seen alive with Peter Tobin on the 24th of September 2006, and is thought to have been attacked by him in a garage on church grounds. The 23-year-old was beaten, sexually assaulted and stabbed before her body was concealed beneath the floor near the confessional in the church. Forensic evidence suggested that she was still alive when she was placed under the floorboards. Police found her body on the 29th of September 2006 and Tobin was arrested in London soon after. Peter Tobin was well known to police as he had previously been convicted for a serious offence. At the time of Angelica's murder, Tobin had only been out of prison for a couple of years. He was released in May 2004 at the age of 58 after serving 10 years of a 14 year sentence for attacking and sexually assaulting two 14 year old girls. Prior to the attack, Tobin forced the girls to drink strong alcohol at knife point. He would go on to stab one of them before leaving them inside a flat, having turned on a gas cooker without lighting it. Thankfully, both girls survived. This crime took place in Hampshire, as despite being from Scotland, Peter Tobin had lived in various parts of the UK, including Glasgow, Margate, Kent, Havant and Sussex, where Eastbourne is located. Interestingly, Peter Tobin was also known to have worked with the homeless community. There have been no follow-up reports in the media linking Jennifer's murder to Peter Tobin. According to the 2021 book Closing the Case on Peter Tobin and Bible John by David Wilson and Paul Harrison, hospital records show that Peter Tobin was being treated in Paisley, Renfrewshire, around 500 miles north of Eastbourne in the days leading up to Jennifer Kiley's murder. He was apparently only discharged on the day of Jennifer's murder which would appear to rule him out of the attack. 
In addition to the 2006 murder of Angelica Cluck, Peter Tobin would eventually be convicted of two more killings after the bodies of two teenagers were found at 50 Irvine Drive in 2007, a house in Margate occupied by Tobin in 1991. The bodies were identified as 15-year-old Vicky Hamilton and 18-year-old Dina McNichol, both of whom had not been seen since 1991. These convictions saw Operation Anagram intensify, however it would be scaled back in June 2011, having failed to identify any more victims. Despite this, many investigators, journalists and the wider public in general remain convinced that Peter Tobin is responsible for more than the three murders for which he was convicted. Peter Tobin died at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary on the 8th of October 2022 at the age of 76. Exactly a week later, his ashes were scattered at sea after no relatives or next of kin claimed his remains. Despite the case being reopened for the first time in 2011, Jennifer's murder received zero media coverage from 2007 until in 2017 when UK newspaper The Mirror reported that another high profile offender may be responsible. In the early hours of the 25th of September 2005, 18-year-old Sally Ann Bowman was raped, murdered and robbed following a night out with her older sister Nicole and a group of their friends. The following year, DNA found at the crime scene was linked to a 35-year-old man from Croydon named Mark Philip Dixie. A swab of Dixie's DNA had been taken following an altercation at a pub just a couple of weeks prior to his arrest. Dixie had a long history of convictions including mugging a woman at knife point, indecent assault, assaulting a police officer and sexual assault. Emigrating to Australia in 1993, Dixie overstayed his visa and was eventually deported after being found guilty of another sex offence. Dixie was convicted of Sally Ann's murder in 2008 and his DNA has gone on to prove his guilt in a number of other serious sexual offences committed both in the UK and abroad. Sally Ann Bowman's mother, Linda, told the Mirror newspaper in November 2017 that she believed Mark Dixie was responsible for the 2005 murder of Jennifer Kiley. Quote, Everything fits with it being Dixie. We always knew Sally Ann was not the first person he killed. I always said there are other murders and I hope they find the evidence. If you have any information about Jennifer's murder, please come forward. The article makes several references to general similarities between the murders of Jennifer and Sally Ann, including the fact both women were attacked while alone at night, stabbed and sexually assaulted. Detective Chief Inspector Emma Heater, in charge of the Jennifer Kiley investigation in 2017, would quash any suggestion of Dixie's involvement, and is quoted within the Mirror article as stating, Sussex Police have already engaged with the Metropolitan Police and at this time there is no known connection between the murder of Sally Ann Bowman and the murder of Jennifer Kiley. However, a spokesperson for Sussex Police would also tell the Mirror, quote, the Jennifer Kiley case was recently reviewed by the major crime team and is currently active. A new line of inquiry has come to light and is currently being investigated, but we do not expect a result from this for some time. Further information regarding this lead was not revealed for another four years as Jennifer's case once again slipped out of public view. In mid-January 2021, 16 years after Jennifer's murder, Sussex police shared drone footage of the seafront shelter in which Jennifer's body was found to help promote a fresh witness appeal and finally reveal further details on the new line of inquiry mentioned years earlier. It was announced that since 2017, police had been working on a new forensic line of inquiry relating to unidentified DNA found at the scene. Emma Heater told the Daily Mail newspaper, quote, As a result of the further forensic evidence, we have the ability to eliminate people from our inquiry. Jennifer's family deserve to know what happened to her and who was responsible. Further information about the current line of forensic inquiry is not being revealed at this time. Police would once again seek the help of the BBC's Crime Watch, now Crime Watch Live, in an effort to generate new leads. On the morning of Tuesday the 9th of March 2021, Jennifer's case was featured for the second time on the programme. Unfortunately, like the 2005 episode, it has not been posted online and can no longer be viewed on the BBC's website. 
According to the Sussex Police website, DS Emma Heater and Jennifer's mother, Margaret, both appeared on the episode. No new information was reported in the weeks and months that followed the second Crime Watch appeal. The following January in 2022, on the anniversary of Jennifer's murder, a Sussex Police spokesperson told the media, quote, There are currently no new lines of inquiry in the investigation into the murder of Jennifer Kiley in Eastbourne in 2005. We received several calls from the public as a result of our latest appeals for information last year, but none produced new information. Over 12 months later, in March 2023, police would issue a renewed appeal and Jennifer's case would once again be featured on Crime Watch Live. Thankfully, the case's third appearance on the programme has been archived and can be viewed online in full. It features segments of the reconstruction which aired in the 2005 episode as Jennifer's last known movements are detailed. During the episode, Emma Heater discusses the difficulty investigators have faced in trying to identify Jennifer's killer. Quote, the biggest challenge in this investigation was probably Jennifer's lifestyle. There wasn't an address for us to go and search. She didn't use mobile phones. There wasn't a financial footpath. It was difficult to track down people that may have had contact with Jennifer. We didn't know if this was someone who knew Jennifer or whether it was a stranger. This was a very, very complicated case to try and solve. We have now got new DNA at the scene, which is very significant for this investigation. We need to find the person whose DNA that is. Jennifer's mother, Margaret, was also interviewed for the program, stating, quote, I think about her every day, but on her anniversary, I can't stop. I can't switch off. I get mad. Somebody somewhere knows who it is and what he's done. Just please, come forward and let us know. I don't know how anybody could have done that. She was no threat, but he took her life from her, and took mine too, to a certain extent. To close out the segment on Jennifer's murder, host Rav Wilding mentions only one specific person that investigators wanted to speak with that had originally been mentioned in the media during 2005. The individual is described as male and was seen on CCTV and by witnesses on Friday the 21st of January 2005. He was described as having an Eastern European accent, around 5 feet 10 inches tall, slim to medium build, short, light blonde hair, roundish face, dominant cheeks and jawline, and a very straight nose. He was wearing a dark blue jacket with a collar zipped up to the chin a pair of grey jeans and white trainers. This witness was also appealed to directly in a statement on the Sussex Police website following the programme. At the time of recording, there have been no further updates or appeals in relation to Jennifer's murder. While researching Jennifer's murder, I made efforts to contact a number of current and former members of Sussex Police in an attempt to not only gain a better understanding of the investigation, but also try to establish why such a violent crime in what appears to be such a beautiful part of the country seemingly received so little media attention. One of those individuals was Paul Pierce, Divisional Commander for Eastbourne in 2005. Paul, now retired, appeared at the first police press conference days after Jennifer's body was found alongside lead investigator Tony O'Donnell. Not only was Paul kind enough to agree to speak with me, he also revealed that his wife, Kaylee, was the family liaison officer appointed in the original investigation. Okay, so, hello, um, I'm obviously an abbreviation of family liaison officer. Um, and essentially, the role of um, a flow is to be the link between the family and the investigation team. One of the first things you do when you meet the family, introduce yourself, is explain that you are also an investigator, so that that's made very clear to them, so they understand that although you'll be there to help them um, with issues and explain things to them, you are also an investigator yourself. In lots of cases, that doesn't really, that isn't particularly relevant, but there are obviously cases whereby the suspect could be in the family, which obviously then is quite crucial, um, and there's a lot of pressure um, put on the family liaison officer there, because they could be obtaining intelligence. 
from a flow point of view, back in 2005, it wasn't completely new, but it, the role wasn't as well established as it is now. Back in those days, you only had one flow assigned to a case whereas now you always have two. And from my perspective, I had a day job. Being a flow isn't a full-time role. It's something that you put yourself forward for, you're trained, and then you're called out as and when you're needed. So I was called out to be the flow um, for Operation Kitty Wake. And Kitty Wake was one, I mean, it's horrendous, as you know. One of the crucial elements of this was to try and identify Jennifer. From my point of view as the flow, they need me there because what they need to do is as soon as they've identified her, we need to get to the family, crucially, as quickly as we can because we don't want them hearing what's happened by the media and the press. So we identified who she was and then what we've got is a name um, and no more than that really. You then have your analysts, your researchers, your intelligence people to try and do some work around identifying who her family might be. And the first person that they identified was her dad and that was literally a case of me sort of jumping in the car very late at night in the hours of darkness, <laughs> driving up to see him in London. Um, and I mean, that's shocking, you know, to suddenly get a knock on the door from a police officer telling them what's happened to their daughter. It's horrendous, you know. And then from there, he was able to tell me who the other family members were, because it was quite, I would use the word fractured family. A lot of them were sort of, they were all sort of separate and, and living apart and, and, you know, hadn't been in contact for a little while. I mean, it, it was her dad, first of all, and in effect, he got the ball rolling, telling us who the other family members were. And it was obviously for me to get out to mum in Ireland wasn't something I could do immediately. Yeah. Um, and then we found out about her partner and the children afterwards, not, not days after, not weeks afterwards, but, you know, a couple of days afterwards. And again, that was crucial because we couldn't have her children finding out about this in any other way of than course. from their dad. The flow is responsible for doing a family tree. Obviously there are identification needs to be done, DNA samples to confirm her family and um, that's something we had dental records but you have to go a step further than that and also you take statements so you have to take a statement from each family member and that takes time bearing in mind all the traveling involved and, and that they're all living in different places and an investigation like that is i would use the expression fast and furious to start with we need to get out there and do as much as we can and in those early days the team are working really hard they're doing lots of things and whatever they feel should be passed to the family will, will come through me and so on a big investigation like this I would say that I probably stayed on it sort of full time going to the briefings and working every day probably for a good week or two and then after that you you go back to your day job but you do then do phone calls or if you need to make visits you come away from your day job to do them as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been anything, there wasn't anything for quite a long period of time. I believe they started some more forensic work a few years ago, in the mid-teens, late teens. Um, and at that time, I wasn't uh, the liaison officer. They assigned somebody new because I was due to retire in 2020. Okay. And those sort of matters can take a long time. And here we are in 2023, and obviously um, it's not yet got to the stage that they would have liked. Could you maybe just give me a sense of, of what sort of, in 2005, crime was like in the area? I was responsible for a geographical area of Sussex called a division, part of which was Eastbourne. And at that time, there were five divisions in Sussex, so I was a divisional command. They called it a divisional commander. Eastbourne was the biggest town in that area. And my responsibility was for the day-to-day -day policing of that town. And Eastbourne actually had a serious drug problem at that time. And, and we had lots of burglaries, lots of acquisitive crime. It was a really serious heroin problem then. So that was my priority to deal with those kind of things. I, I, it was fair to say I was I, I was under more pressure than any other divisional commander in Sussex from the chief constable because of the level of uh, crime uh, in Eastbourne at that time. And then what happened is if you had a murder in Eastbourne, what, where we were in. Uh, 2005 was that there was a central CID department in Sussex called Headquarters CID and it had a structure uh, whereby it had 
teams that would be sent to a division if there was a murder. The head of the team was the senior investigating officer, and in this case, it was Tony O'Donnell, and he would take, bring with him a team of people who would investigate that murder so that the people on my division didn't have a lot of involvement. They, they might have wanted, in a case like this, which is quite complicated, they might have asked me for a couple of detectives or a couple of people to do certain things. But generally, you had a team with an experienced senior investigating officer and officers who were experienced in dealing with murders. What, what they'd done is they'd, uh, in order to support these teams, around the county, they had major crime suites, which were suites of offices equipped in with the sorts of things that you needed to deal with major crime. Jennifer's case, can you sort of remember when you first heard about that? Yeah, I I can't remember how I first heard that. I, I've got a photo of me at the scene, so yeah, I think she was found about five o'clock in the morning. So yep. you probably know that. Yeah, about five o'clock in the morning, I think. So I probably would have got a phone call. And I can remember that I went, I, mean, I might have even got straight from home to the scene, actually. And uh, I met with Tony O'Donnell at the scene. There was, yeah, it was early in the morning because there was nobody there. It was it, it, There was no members of the public, no onlookers, nothing. Uh, he and I were there and, and all the scenes of crime people uh, were there. Um, we had a chat. I can't, and I, I just don't remember anything really about the chat. My role in a case like this primarily was to do a thing called a community impact assessment. And that was to look at how that murder would, and what it says on the tin, would impact on the community of Eastbourne. Would people be frightened? It would be more important in a case, perhaps like Stephen Lawrence, where there would be a portion of the community that would be particularly angst by it. Yes. Um, so a community impact assessment in Eastbourne, uh, would, if the person who was killed was somebody like Jennifer, so sadly, it was quite a short uh, process because the population wasn't particularly interested. And as part of doing the community's impact assessment, you got local officers to go into the community to get a feel of what people thought. So it wasn't just a, well, what do we think the community thing? We used to go into the community, talk to local councillors, community leaders, about what they felt people were thinking about the case and the way it was impacting. Okay. Uh, and frankly, this case didn't really impact on anybody at all other than it happened in a wealthy area of the best, probably the best part of Eastbourne, the wealthiest part of Eastbourne. And when we started putting officers out on patrol, uh, people were saying, can you not do that? Because that's actually more frightening than knowing that somebody who doesn't live here has been murdered. So that was the sad thing about it. Uh, and it disappeared off the off the radar quite, quite quickly. I take it that it was a woman of her age uh, walking her dog along the seafront at I don't know, 8 o'clock in the evening who was murdered and then set fire to it, it there would have been an absolute furore because people would then think that could be me and that's what affects generally the way the public think about crime whether it's murder or any crime is how likely am I to be a victim of that crime and the people in that part of Eastbourne would have looked at Jennifer and her lifestyle and thought well I'm not likely to be therefore it doesn't worry me that's how it works Sort of within what time frame could you feel that the public was not very interested? First couple of days, really. The other thing that um, is a good barometer for that, for that kind of thing is, is the local media. Uh, there was a local paper there uh, called the Eastbourne Herald, and um, there, there was a press conference, but I only ever went to one. It didn't cause a great deal of press interest. Uh, being a local paper, that, that, that they ran it for a, two or three weeks. It didn't surprise me. Uh, that, that um, it, there really wasn't a lot of a uh, lot of local concern about it. Is this one that gets solved? Do you think? If that person whose profile they've got was arrested and their DNA was taken and it was matched uh, and they they've got sufficient evidence, that person would be convicted. If that person's now if that person's already died, that case that DNA isn't going to solve that case, is it? The extra difficulty with this one is that. There is so little in, um, evidence to be obtained because fire causes so much damage, you know. So, so any sort of evidence on her that you would ordinarily have, you know, um, if she'd been sexually attacked, um, semen and that sort of thing, that's all gone. That evidence is not there. So they have so little evidence 
Um, so it's not like they have lots of things that as science improves and technology improves, they can examine that again. There just isn't. I think, I mean, I think in some ways it's quite unique and the MO um, is quite specific. And I, I do find it interesting that we haven't had another oh, yes. similar one. That's the thing. So you tend to think, is that because they've only done it once? Who knows? Or they just been very clever. But that to me is pretty amazing. As far as I'm aware, it's not linked to any other similar case. For a person to be murdered in the open, somewhere where, if there's flames, somebody could have seen that. It was it was on the seafront. It, and all right, it was quite, it's quiet down there, but that person who was doing that is taking a risk. And, and to set fire to somebody in the open like that is very, very unusual. Murder in Sussex was well resourced. It was it was well investigated. Um, that there was no reason why this case wouldn't have been investigated really well, and, and I have no reason to believe it wasn't. So this, and so it really is odd. It's a mystery. It's totally mystery. sad for Jennifer's mother that you know. Uh, I mean, she's she's not a young lady anymore, as any mother would be. You know, sort sort of totally heartbroken and and being so far away, she didn't understand what had happened and why it happened, why anybody would want to do this. And uh, she's got her faith, and and you know, it would give her some peace really if she was to, you know, if somebody was held responsible and accountable. And I just think it's dreadfully, dreadfully sad the circumstances that Jennifer was living in at the time and that this has happened to her and her family. Kate, you're a bit more into true crime, and yeah, I know. Yeah. Kaylee, Kaylee loves listening to true crime podcasts and things. Uh, I, I don't normally, I'm not normally interested. Uh, it's policing as what I did when I was young. Um, but presenting the facts in, in a clear way, unbiased. yeah, a clear un- unbiased uh, way, um, is yeah, is, is is a way to do it. So good luck to you. I, you know, I think you're doing. Um, you know, you do good. I should, I should watch the rest of them. Anything that brings this, you know, to the four people's minds yeah. has to be a good thing. Has to be. Jennifer Kiley spent the last few years of her life suffering from an illness which forced her away from the ones she loved and who loved her back very dearly. It's truly heartbreaking to think that somebody already struggling so much could be subjected to such a brutal and degrading attack resulting in the loss of their life. The DNA found at the crime scene has been in the possession of police for a number of years and does not match anybody currently on the national database. Could this potentially indicate a one-off offence? Or, perhaps more terrifyingly, could this mean the person or persons responsible for Jennifer's murder have continued to commit similar heinous acts while remaining undetected? In either case, this DNA evidence could potentially bring the person or persons responsible for Jennifer's murder to justice and hopefully provide some form of closure to her friends and family. In order for that to happen, police are desperately still seeking the help of the public to identify who the DNA belongs to. If you have any information that could help breathe new life into Operation Kittywake, please contact Sussex Police via their website at sussex.police.uk or alternatively call the UK non-emergency number on 101. The Crime Portal is a channel dedicated to exploring lesser known murder and missing persons cases. For further information on this case or to submit a suggestion for future videos, please visit the Crime Portal website. And as always, thank you for watching.